What is a noun? A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. Let's look at an example. In this photo, there are several different nouns. This woman, Jill, is a person. The hat is a thing. The beach where the photo was taken is a place. Now suppose she's thinking about peace. Peace is an idea. See all the nouns here? So let's think about a basketball player. So maybe you've played basketball before in your life, maybe you haven't, but just put yourself in the shoes of a basketball player. So what happens if you're a basketball player and you shoot free throws every day? Well, if you practice your free throws every day, over, to, over time, you're going to get better at shooting free throws. And it's the same thing with GED studying. So if you wanna get better at GED math, what do you do? If you take it a little bit at a time and you study, you're eventually going to get better at it. Recently, I pulled my GED subscribers to see which subjects they wanted the most help on. And overwhelmingly, Math got the majority of the votes. So the point here is that it's not just you. If you're struggling with math, know that you're in the same boat as a lot of people. The first term is speed. And speed is the rate at which an object moves. So let's say that you're either driving a car or you're riding in a car and you're going 45 miles per hour. So that's an example of a speed. So what GED comma rules do you have to know for the GED test? And why do I have these two candles here? Am I gonna juggle them in the video? You'll have to wait and see. You know, GED studying can sometimes be boring. So to liven it up and to reward you for making it this far into the video, I'm gonna show you a video of me juggling those candles. Ready? Those candles weren't actually lit in that shot there. But maybe, just maybe, I might actually juggle them with a live flame later in the video. Hint, hint. So let me just be honest here. I was gonna juggle candles with a live flame, but there is a smoke detector right above where I'm filming here, so I don't know if that's a good idea. But you already know I'm gonna do it anyway, so just keep watching. Comma rule number five is to use a comma to separate three or more list items. So here's an example. My shopping list includes butter, eggs, milk, and cereal. So there's several commas missing here. Where should they go? Hopefully you see here that we would want a comma after butter, eggs, and milk. Okay, but don't think that even because you're really smart, don't think that you don't still have to stop and study for the GED test. That's not the way it works, okay? It, it's not, oh, just because, you know, hey, I was smart in high school, but I just didn't do well because I had to leave. I didn't care. I didn't pay attention. I had to leave because of this reason and that reason. I couldn't focus because things were going on at home, okay? And, and that all may be true, but don't think that, you know, hey, you're too smart to be doing the GED and you're high and mighty and this and that, okay? If you have to do the GED to get on with your life, then you got to do the best with where you're at in your life and feeling like you're high and mighty and you're too good to be doing this is just not going to work. It's not going to get you anywhere, okay? So be humble and just be honest and be realistic and try to help other people. And when you see questions that are easy, be grateful for them. You know, understand that most of the questions on the test are going to be challenging, but you will get some easy questions if you're well prepared. A shout out to Aisha for requesting the topic here that I'm going to talk about in this video. So let's get into it starting with GED language arts. You'll have 150 minutes to complete the reasoning through language arts section. There are three different parts. In parts one and three, you'll answer multiple choice, fill in the blank, drop down, and other types of questions. The second part is the essay, which you'll have 45 minutes to complete. In case you're not sure how to start preparing for your essay, you can check out my video that I made on how to beat the essay. The link is down below in the description. Also note that you'll have a 10 minute break between parts two and three. Additionally, know that the three topics on the language arts section are reading for meaning, identifying and creating arguments, and grammar and language. Next, let's talk about social studies. You'll have 70 minutes to complete the social studies section. This section has one part, and you'll have a series of multiple choice, drag and drop, fill in the blank, and other types of questions on this section, and calculators are allowed. The three topics that you'll need to know for social studies are reading for meaning, analyzing historical events and arguments, and using numbers and graphs. Let's now switch our focus to the science section. You'll have 90 minutes to complete the science section. There's one single part with questions made up of multiple choice, drag and drop, fill in the blank, and other style of questions. You can use your calculator for the science section. The three topics for science that you need to be familiar with are reading for meaning, designing and interpreting science experiments, and using numbers and graphics in science. Now let's talk about the math section. On the math section, you'll have 115 minutes total, and you'll have two different parts. For the first part, you won't be able to use a calculator, but you can for the second part. Note that the first part is very short, so you'll be able to use your calculator for most of the test. They'll give you a formula sheet you can use on your computer during the test. 
The four topics on the math test are basic math, geometry, basic algebra, and graphs and functions. So to make life simple, I've given you this list of some common square roots. Now you can just memorize these, add them to your notes, or just tuck these away in the back of your head, but these are all good to know because they're gonna come up a lot. What if on your test you get an example like this? The square root of 20 equals blank, and you have to solve it without a calculator. Well, how in the world are you supposed to do this? Well, it's actually not that hard if we break it down here. So what we wanna do is we wanna think of numbers that will multiply together to give us 20. So let's think of pairs here. So I know that 20 times one is going to give us 20. So we'll use 20 and one. And I also know that 10 and two will multiply together to give us 20. Can you think of any other pairs here? What about four and five? Well, four and five multiply together to give us 20. So what you wanna do here is just think of numbers that'll multiply together to give you the number here underneath the square root symbol. And then once you've done that, you want to think about your list of common square roots and you want to look for numbers that are on the list here that have square roots that are common. So what about this square root of four here? So the square root of four is two. So we're gonna use this pair here. And the trick is that you can rewrite the square root of 20 as the square root of four times five. And again, the reason that we can do that is because four times five equals 20. So what I've just done is I've taken the square root of 20 and I rewrote it as the square root of four times five. And now we can rewrite this again as the square root of four times the square root of five. And now here's where I'm going with this. So remember that four had the, the square root of four is on our list of common square roots. It's just two. So we can actually rewrite this again as two square root of five. And that's actually gonna be the answer. Velocity is defined as speed in a given direction. So if we just say 45 miles per hour, that's an example of a speed. But if we say 45 miles per hour going west or north or south or whatever the direction happens to be, that's an example of velocity. So I wanna start by giving a champion shout out to Randon. And Randon shared that the best advice for the GED test is to go in without a negative mind and to instead go in thinking that you can pass and then you're gonna be fine. And so I really love this advice here. And this is so true here. You have to really have that right mindset before you go in to take the GED test. A lot of people don't know that studies that have been done by the GED test taking company themselves even show that people who self-study do better, much better than those who take the classes a lot of the time on average. What we can see here is that in the study that was done with over 90,000 people, right? They had over 90,000 people and they grouped them up into these groups and we see that in all cases, okay, on average, the individual study groups, so the group that did their own thing, they did their own study and preparation, they scored much better on average on all of the sections than the community college prep classes takers and the public school adult ed class prep takers, whatever that group is. This first tip will help you with punctuation and capitalization so that you don't lose points that you deserve to get. In your writing, you must end each sentence with a period, exclamation mark, or a question mark. Exclamation marks are for showing strong feelings or excitement. Question marks are for questions and periods or for statements. Now in your essay, try to stick mainly to periods. You can throw in an exclamation mark or a question mark or two if you'd like to, but they're usually not necessary. When in doubt, just stick to periods. Are mental blocks holding you back when it comes to succeeding with the GED test? Well then in this video, I'm gonna tell you exactly what to do. Okay, story time. I once worked with a GED test taker who could ace almost any math problem during practice, but then still failed the GED math test multiple times before finally passing. How could she ace everything in practice, but then still struggle so much with the real thing? Well, the reason is because she had mental blocks in the way that were stopping her from succeeding. Where did these mental blocks come from? Think back to all the negative messages you got when you were younger from people in your life, maybe from teachers or even people close to you who told you that you'd never amount to anything or that you'd never be smart enough to get good grades or that you'd never be able to do well on tests. Now, even if these people never meant to hurt you, through the repetition of hearing these ideas over and over again, you accepted them as true when you were too young to think critically about them. And this may be causing you to sabotage yourself today when it comes to succeeding with the GED test, but you don't have to live this way anymore. Through the repetition of positive thoughts about yourself and your ability to succeed with the GED, you can overcome any mental block that you have that's holding you back. And if your desire to pass is strong enough and you're willing to stick with it no matter what, then it's just gonna be a matter of time until you pass. There's a legend on the GED test, it's kind of a myth that at the beginning of the question, you're going to get 
at the beginning of the test, you're gonna get a bunch of easy questions. Then in the middle of the test, you're gonna get a bunch of really, really, really hard questions that you have no idea how to answer. And then at the end, you're gonna have a bunch of easy questions again. And so the myth is that a lot of students, they get stopped up in the middle of the test by those hard questions. And so the test taking company designed the test so that way you're gonna be thrown off by those hard questions and spend all your time doing those. And you're never gonna to get to those easy questions at the end and you're gonna pass. And you're not gonna pass, you're gonna fail. Now, I don't know for sure if that's actually true, if that's actually how the test is set up or not, but I do know this. You are going to get a mix of hard questions on your test that you're probably not going to know how to do unless you've taken the time to master every single little detail of GED math like the back of your hand and that's absolutely not necessary to pass. Let's start with the future tense. The future tense is used for an action that hasn't occurred yet. To make the future tense we put the word will in front of the base form which gives us will deflate. For example, I will deflate the balloon. Future perfect tense shows us that an action will happen by a specific future time. We put the words will have in front of the past tense form of the base verb, which gives us will have deflated. For example, Parker will have deflated the balloon by the end of this video. For the present tense, we would say deflate or deflates. For example, Parker deflates the balloon or I deflate the balloon. The present progressive tense is used to show that an action is in progress. For the present progressive tense, we add ing to the present tense and put is in front of it, which gives us is deflating. For example, Parker is deflating the balloon right now. There's also the present perfect tense, which is used for an action that started in the past and continues in the present. For this, we'd say has deflated. For example, Parker has deflated the balloon during this video. After the balloon has been deflated, we'd use the past tense form. For example, Parker deflated the balloon. Finally, to show that I deflated the balloon before a specific time in the past, we'd use the past perfect tense by putting the word had in front of deflated, which would give us had deflated. For example, Parker had deflated the balloon earlier. And acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes. So let's say that you're in the city and this is the way that people in the city drive. So they're cruising along and as they come to a yellow light, they press the gas pedal down and try to accelerate through the light before it turns red and they have to stop. So that's an example of acceleration, right? So changing speed would be acceleration and it could also be changing direction. So if you're driving and then you take a right turn or a left turn, or if you reverse the car, you're changing your direction. Newton's first law is the law of inertia, which states that an object at rest stays at rest until a force acts on it. And an object in motion stays in motion in a straight line and at a constant speed until a force acts on it. So for example, let's consider hockey. So if a player hits a hockey puck, that puck should keep moving according to Newton's law. That puck should keep moving at a constant speed, meaning it's not gonna slow down or speed up in a straight line, which means that it's not gonna change direction. And it's gonna keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed until a force acts on it. You have to have such a strong desire that you can start to see yourself as having already passed the GED test. One thing that helps many test takers is affirmations. That's when you affirm to yourself over and over again that you can pass the test until you start to believe it, and then you get out there and you do it. Note that setbacks are gonna come up. That's part of life. But no matter what happens, I want you to commit to passing this test. No matter what happens, I want you to never quit. In as much detail as possible, form a mental picture of yourself having passed the GED test. Then work hard at your studying every day. And from there, it'll just be a matter of time. But the important thing is to hold that picture in mind no matter what happens, even if it feels like you're going backwards. So Newton's second law is sometimes just called the law of motion, or it can be called the law of acceleration. And it states that the acceleration of an object depends on the mass and force. And so we can write an equation, and this is a, a very famous equation, and it's important to understand for the GED test. And the equation is F equals M times A. And of course, F stands for force, M stands for mass, and A stands for acceleration. Just think about weightlifting. The greater the mass of the barbell, the more force you have to use to maintain constant acceleration. Rule number six is to use commas to separate extra or unnecessary info from the rest of the sentence. So again, let's go right into an example. I brought my cat Tommy to the vet. There should be two commas here that we're missing. Where should they go? Hopefully you see here that the comma should go after cat and after Tommy. 
Don't believe me that I'm really gonna juggle live flames in this video? Well, don't believe me, just watch.